every breath in our lungs. Lord, we thank you for those things. We praise you for those things. But Lord, before any of that, Lord, you are worthy. Lord, because you are. We pray that you would be magnified in this place as we run to you, our Father, protector, our refuge. God bless this time in Jesus' name.
our source of strength. You're our hiding place. You're our refuge, Lord. God, I want to lift up anyone in here that's just had a week. Lord, we've all had weeks. And God, we're right now, God, we're choosing to run to you. God, I pray that you would bless that decision to choose you. Welcome everybody and I want to welcome everybody who's joining us online with our live stream. It's good to see you guys. 
I love seeing our church filling up more and more. Uh, I hope you have your Bible. If you need a Bible, there's Bibles on either side of the sound booth if you didn't bring one. But we've got a long chapter today and you're going to want to read along. So grab a Bible if you need it or open an app, not Facebook, a Bible app. And let's go to Daniel chapter 4. If you've been with us for the last six weeks, you know that we are studying the book of Daniel and the series title is Standing Firm in a Falling World. And my goal as we study the book of Daniel is each week to prepare us to stand firm because the world is falling apart around us. And today we're going to tackle chapter 4. And this is one of those great chapters in the Bible, very unique, but it has its own introduction. So I don't want to say anything more than just jumping into verses 1 through 3, which serve as our introduction. We'll pray in a couple of moments. But I want you to notice this is a very different chapter. Verse 1 says, Nebuchadnezzar the king, to all peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in the earth, peace be multiplied to you. Let's pull three things out of this first verse that are going to really help us along the way here today. I want you to notice the author of Daniel chapter 4 is not Daniel. The author of Daniel chapter 4 is King Nebuchadnezzar. And this is what's going to blow your mind. The Holy Spirit has allowed a Gentile, idol-worshipping, pagan king to write one of the chapters in your Bible. And I know someone's going to yell out, blasphemy! Right? But... You'll see as we get to the end of the chapter that there's no need to call for that because I'm going to let you in on a little secret right here. We're about to see Nebuchadnezzar come into a living relationship with God. That's what this chapter is all about. Now I want you to notice who he writes to. His audience is, notice, the peoples, nations, and languages that dwell on the earth. So Nebuchadnezzar is writing to all of the inhabitants of his kingdom, to everybody that is a citizen of the kingdom that he rules over. And before we go on anymore, I, I want to say a few things about Nebuchadnezzar. History has taught us that Nebuchadnezzar was a ruthless man. Nebuchadnezzar was a killer. Nebuchadnezzar was a man who was trained in the arts of torture. And as we've seen in previous chapters, even his own people, as he gave decrees, if they didn't do his will, he just had them executed, chopped in pieces, and then had their houses burned down. Sounds like a great guy, right? But I want you to notice something so different because in previous chapters, he has proven himself to be this ruthless guy. But if you look at the end of verse 1, notice he says here, he's wishing the inhabitants of his kingdom not just peace, but he says, peace be multiplied to you. And how is it that this ruthless king has now completely changed character? He's no longer this idol-worshipping maniac of a man who loves to kill and torture people. Now he says, it's my desire that everybody would experience what I have, and that is peace multiplied. And so... If you've been with us over a number of weeks, you're probably asking yourself this question, how did we go from him being what he was to what he appears to be here? He's completely out of character. Well, what's happened is that he has a new character. He has the character of the Lord. He's now acting like a peacemaker, and you're saying, how, how did he get here? Well, notice verse 2 and 3, Nebuchadnezzar will tell us. And in verse 2, he says, I thought it good to declare the signs and wonders that the Most High God has worked for me. How great are His signs and how mighty His wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and His dominion is from generation to generation. What we're seeing here is Nebuchadnezzar is sharing his personal testimony and he's saying to everybody who will listen, he's saying, I want to tell you the story of how I went from being an idol-worshipping pagan to being a child of the living God. But I want to share, you, share with you, th this was not a quick transition. And in fact, there's some history here. Make your way back to the end of chapter 2. 
We'll put this up on the screen in a minute, but to lay the foundation before we read chapter 2, verses uh, 46 and 47, Nebuchadnezzar has this revelatory dream from the Lord, and he needs an interpretation, so he calls all the wise men of his kingdom together, and they can't tell him the dream, so he doesn't give them the chance to tell the interpretation, but he does give a decree and says, now you guys all have to die. And so Daniel says, hold on, give me a chance. And he goes into his prayer closet and he comes back and he tells the Lord, or excuse me, tells the king, I, I can give you the interpretation of the dream and I can tell you what the dream is. And so Daniel does that. And I want you to notice the king's response, Daniel 2, 46 and 47 up on the screen. Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell on his face, prostrate, before Daniel and he commanded that they should present an offering and incense to him. The king answered Daniel and said, truly your God is the God of gods, the Lord of kings and a revealer of secrets since you could reveal this secret. For the first time as recorded in scripture, God intervenes into Nebuchadnezzar's life and he does it miraculously and Nebuchadnezzar has an experience with God, but Nebuchadnezzar doesn't yield to God. Nebuchadnezzar has this experience with God, but he doesn't surrender to God. And so then we get to chapter 3. Make your way to the end of chapter 3, and I'll give you, again, the history leading up to it. Nebuchadnezzar has an image made. And he tells everybody they have to bow down to it. Well, Daniel's three friends, they say, we, we can't bow down to that. That goes against everything we've learned from God's word. So he has them cast into a fiery furnace. And as he looks into that fiery furnace, I'm kind of rewording what he said last week in our study. He, he said, the son of the most high God is in the fire with them. And he's saving them from what the fire was designed to do. And so afterwards, chapter 3, verses 28 and 29, notice what Nebuchadnezzar says. Nebuchadnezzar spoke saying, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who sent his angel and delivered his servants who trusted in him. And they have frustrated the king's word and yielded their bodies that they should not serve nor worship any god except their own god. And then verse 29, therefore I make a decree that any people, nation, or language which speaks anything amiss against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces and their houses shall be made an ash heap because there is no other God who can deliver like this. For the second time, Nebuchadnezzar is having an experience with God, but as we're about to see, it did not lead to him surrendering himself to God. And so as we get to chapter 4, what you're going to see is that Nebuchadnezzar is now going to share his testimony of how he became a follower of the Lord. So chapter 4, we're going to call this message title, Some Have to Learn the Hard Way. <laughs> First service, it was really interesting. I asked, how many of you are the kind of people that have to learn the hard way? Because I tend to be. As I get older, I'm not nearly as much. How many of you need to repent for lying right now? We had a lot of hands go up in first service and this is oftentimes what happens is, is we have to learn things the hard way because we're not willing to really listen to God and do things His way. We're about to jump into this chapter but I need to ask you a question because this is really going to come into play. Please don't raise your hand. I just want you to answer between you and the Lord but how many of us in this room are still living experience to experience. In other words, we're pretty content going through life calling ourselves a Christian, but when the going gets really tough, when you get in a real scrape, we call out to God and he's so kind and so loving and he answers us and it fuels us through that next problem. But when that problem's over, all of a sudden we don't really need God as much before. And we kind of live from crisis to crisis. And when we're in a crisis, we call out to God. So, so we live from experience to experience, but we don't really surrender our lives to God. If you're in that camp today, I'm just going to tell you before the Bible study, I hope that you change the way you're living before this study is over because 
Nebuchadnezzar is about to share with us that he did it the hard way. And I believe if Nebuchadnezzar could leave heaven, because I do believe that's where he's at. I believe he's with the Lord. If he could come down here and stand on this stage and say to us one thing, I think the one thing he would say is, Saint, don't go through what I had to go through before yielding yourself to God. Surrender now because it's so much easier than doing things the hard way. So today, we'll see the transformation that went on in Nebuchadnezzar's life, and we'll see how it occurred. So let's pray together, and then we'll study chapter 4. Father, in Jesus' name, we're about to open your word and look at one of the most powerful chapters in all of the Old Testament, Lord where we get to see your patience and your kindness and your goodness, but also, Lord, we get to see your hand of discipline in a man's life and how it transformed him. And I pray today, Lord, that we would make a decision as we're reading your word this morning. We would begin to identify areas in our life where we are just like Nebuchadnezzar, where we have to learn things the hard way, where Rather than simply humbling ourselves and allowing you to sit upon the throne of our lives, we continue to be the master of our own kingdom. Just inviting you to come and knock us off of that throne and place yourself there, Lord. And I believe, Lord, that you would save us from the agony that Nebuchadnezzar went through. So let us learn from him. Let us not imitate him. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. And we all said... Amen. What we're going to do today is we're going to break this chapter into a series of sections and we're going to build on D words and it begins in verses 4 through 18 with the king's dream. Meet me at verse 4 and the king writes, he says, I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at rest in my house and I was flourishing in my palace. Now we need to just dig out a few facts here and prepare ourselves for how God is going to use this chapter to speak to us today. Scholars tell us that it's been about 15 or more years since the events of chapter 3. Daniel is probably about 50 years old and Nebuchadnezzar has been sitting on the throne of Babylon for over 35 years. And I want you to see two things that Nebuchadnezzar tells us were going on in his life. And these might be warnings to us. He says, I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at rest in my house. So by the time he had ruled for 35 years, Nebuchadnezzar had basically put down all of his enemies. And in chapter 3, we saw there was an internal power struggle. And those are now over. And the king is, is just able to enjoy a season of rest and a season of peace. And the second thing we see is that he's flourishing in his palace. And so it's this season not only of peace and rest, but of prosperity. Now, how many of us feel like after three and a half decades of thumbing his nose at God, that God should just squish him like a bug? How many of you vote for that? until we realize that there might be people in this room that have been thumbing their nose at the Lord for three and a half decades, and all of a sudden we see things a little different, don't we? And the interesting thing here is that Nebuchadnezzar's story is your story. It's my story in some way or another. And what we're seeing here is a big question. It comes up, why is God allowing this rebel of a king to have rest and peace and prosperity after he's been thumbing his nose at God for three and a half decades? Well, the answer is coming up on the screen. And the first is that Paul in Romans 2.4 tells us a biblical principle. He says, it's the goodness of God that leads you to repentance. God has a number of tools in his toolbox, and the first tool that he tries to use when we're living in rebellion to him is the tool of goodness and blessing. And a lot of times when we're in the midst of rebellion, God, rather than punishing us, blesses us. And it doesn't make sense, especially to the legalist. 
But to those of us who understand what the, what the Bible teaches about grace, it makes all the sense in the world. God is a God of grace and he tries to woo us through goodness and through kindness. I can tell you personal testimony how I have gone through seasons where my heart is rebellious and God draws me back to himself through kindness and through blessing. I've watched it in the lives of other people as well. But God gets to a point where when a person doesn't respond to his kindness, he has to go to the toolbox and pull out a second tool that seems to be extremely effective in the lives of his followers, and it's the tool called suffering. And we're going to see that God is going to have to use this tool on Nebuchadnezzar, but not until he gives him a number of chances to miss the suffering. Look at verse 5. Nebuchadnezzar is still speaking. He says, I saw a dream which made me afraid and the thoughts on my bed and the visions of my head troubled me. Therefore, I issued a decree to bring in all the wise men of Babylon before me that they might make known to me the interpretation of the dream. Then the magicians, the astrologers, the Chaldeans, and the soothsayers came in and I told them the dream and pay attention to this. But they did not make known to me its interpretation. But at last, Daniel came before me. His name is Belteshazzar, according to the name of my God. In him is the spirit of the holy God. And I told the dream before him, saying, Belteshazzar, chief of the magicians, magicians, because I know that the spirit of the holy God is in you, and no secret troubles you, Explain to me the visions of my dream that I have seen and its interpretation. Now, this is going to get really good in a minute, but I just want to lay another foundation. I want to, I want to show you a couple of things that I think is so interesting. I want you to notice two things before we jump into verse 10. I want you to notice that he called first the magicians and the astrologers and the Chaldeans and the soothsayers. He didn't call Daniel first. He called the guys that he was sure would tell him what he wanted to hear. And I don't know about you, but there are times in my life where I have had a bit of a rebellious heart, and I'm very careful who I ask for counsel. I want someone that's going to tell me it's okay for me to be rebellious right now. Right? And I'll use someone else as an example. Okay? Maybe, maybe you're in this place and your boss promised you a raise and, and he didn't give you the raise. So you don't come to myself or someone at church looking for counsel. You go to a guy who you know lives at a very low moral standard and you tell him, hey, my boss told me he was going to give me a raise and six months ago he didn't give me a raise and I'm thinking about just stealing some stuff out of the warehouse. And your friend goes, sounds like a plan to me. Want me to drive the getaway car? <laughs> you know. That's what Nebuchadnezzar's doing. He has gathered himself a group of guys and he says, I'm going to tell you my dream. I want you to tell me what this means. And don't forget that when I don't like what people say, I have them killed. So let's hear the dream, shall we? Let's hear the interpretation. Now look at the second thing. The king notes here that they could not make known the interpretation, doesn't he? No, he doesn't. He says they did not make known the interpretation. They look at the king and they think, I don't feel like dying today. I heard your dream. It's pretty obvious what's going on here. Um, but king, this is what's going on. The IT department says that the uh, internet line is down to the spirit world. So we haven't been able to download any information this week at all. If they get that thing fixed, hey, we'll get back with you and we'll interpret this dream. You see what these guys are doing? They're skating on the king. They're, they're basically saying, we don't want to lose our heads. So king, uh, we can't tell you what is going on. The spirit world has gone silent on us. And so in verse 10, the king shares his dream with Daniel. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to read to you verses 10 through 18. There's a lot of information here. And along the way, I'm just going to make five comments to provide clarity. Uh, so just bear with me here because we're going to read, I believe, nine verses. But starting in verse 10, these were the visions of my head while on my bed. I was looking and behold a tree in the midst of the earth and its height was great. The tree grew and became strong. Its 
height reached the heavens and it could be seen to the ends of the earth. Its leaves were lovely, its fruit was abundant, and in it was food for all. The beasts of the field found shade under it, the birds of the heavens dwelt in its branches, and all flesh was fed from it. I saw in the visions of my head while on my bed, and there was a watcher, a holy one coming down from heaven. So I'll stop and I'll explain just for a minute. This is the king's way of describing an angel, a, a watcher coming down from heaven. Verse 14, he, the angel, cried aloud and said thus, chop down the tree and cut off its branches, strip off its leaves and scatter its fruit. Let the beasts get out from under it and the birds from its branches. Nevertheless, leave the stump and roots in the earth bound with a band of iron and bronze. Those two things represent judgment. In the tender grass of the field. Let it be wet with the dew of heaven. And, and I need you to notice something here. The pronouns are going to change. We're going to change the pronouns from it to him. And, and so Nebuchadnezzar is communicating. He's saying this angel was talking about a tree but now the angel is making us understand that that tree represents a person. The tree is a man. So it says here, And let him graze with the beasts on the grass of the earth, and let his heart be changed from that of a man. Let him be given the heart of a beast, and let seven times pass over him. That word times in prophetic writings will mean years. We'll see that in chapter 7. So this vision Nebuchadnezzar has is going to last for seven years. And then verse 17, this decision is by the decree of the watchers and the sentence by the word of the holy ones in order that the living may know that the most high rules in the kingdom of men gives it to whomever he will and sets over it the lowest of men. And now the dream has ended now Nebuchadnezzar begins speaking again to Daniel. He says, this dream I, King Nebuchadnezzar, have seen. Now you, Belteshazzar, that's Daniel, declare its interpretation since all the wise men of my kingdom are not able to make known to me the interpretation, but you are able for the spirit of the holy God is in you. Now as we're reading this, it doesn't really take a rocket scientist or a trained dream interpreter to know what's going on, right? we realize Nebuchadnezzar is the tree and the tree is about to be chopped down. We realize that God is dealing with the king's pride. And if you look at the middle of verse 17, this is what Nebuchadnezzar really emphasizes. This angel sums up the dream by saying, in order that the living may know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men, gives it to whomever he will, and sets it over the lowest of men. The angel is just basically saying to Nebuchadnezzar in the dream, you've had this dream because God is telling you that you think you're in control, but God is showing you he's in control. You think you've built this kingdom. God built this kingdom. You think you've built this throne. No, God built this throne. And so we've looked at the king's dream. Now in verse 19 through 26, we're going to look at the king's dilemma. And then Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, was astonished for a time, and his thoughts troubled him. So the king spoke and said, Belteshazzar, do not let the dream or its interpretation trouble you. Now let's talk about Daniel for a minute. I'm hoping that what we're about to see in Daniel, you're going to be able to say, hey, that's where I'm at. This is my heart. I want you to notice a couple of things about Daniel's heart and how it's revealed to us in these verses there's a lot that we can learn from Daniel, but we won't camp out here too long. It, it appears that as the king is telling the dream, the Holy Spirit is giving Daniel the interpretation immediately. In, in other words, he doesn't have to go away and pray. As the dream is being told, the interpretation is coming on the fly, and Daniel reacts. And, and the word here, it's the word astonished. That word speaks about the fact that Daniel was personally impacted. He said, as, as I thought about this dream that the king is having and the interpretation, it knocked me back a little bit. 
And this is why you've got to understand that for the last 35 years, Daniel has worked for the king. He has built a professional relationship with the king. But and you can probably relate to this. If you've worked for anybody for a long period of time, you also develop a personal relationship with your boss, don't you? And from the very beginning, Daniel realizes, I was brought as a captive into Nebuchadnezzar's court, not just to be his employee and his servant, but to be his friend and to witness to him and to lead him to the living God of the universe. So for 35 years, Daniel has been witnessing, mostly through his life, but I'm guessing when the opportunity was there, Daniel got to do stuff like, you know, well, praise God. And Nebuchadnezzar got to see his faith. Wow, boss, that's awesome. It seems like God's really working in your life. You know, he, he's witnessing. And Nebuchadnezzar is being impacted. Now Daniel looks and he says, my boss, my employer, my friend is about to go through a very, very, deep and impacting trial and he says I'm agonizing Daniel's just totally agonizing and when the king sees it he says Daniel just come right out tell me the interpretation and before I go on I just want to remind you that from time to time God is going to use you the way God used Daniel God is going to give you insight and vision into somebody's life and sometimes it's not going to be hey that person's going to win the lottery next week Every once in a while, God's going to give you insight into somebody's life and you're going to realize this person is about to go into a season of God's discipline or God's judgment because of their pride or their arrogance and their unrepentance. And how do you respond to that? Well, I warned them, whatever they go through, they deserve. Don't think that's the heart that God wants you to have. Daniel says, man, this just this blew me away. Now, Look at Daniel's response. I love this. Verse 19, right in the middle. Belteshazzar answered and said, My Lord, may the dream concern those who hate you, and its interpretation concern your enemies. This is, this is Daniel's way of saying, Your Majesty, I'm about to give you the interpretation of this dream, and I just wish from the bottom of my heart that this was about your enemies and not about you, but it is about you. And so Daniel's just saying, it's breaking my heart. And so here comes the interpretation. Verse 20. The tree that you saw, which grew and became strong, whose height reached to the heavens and which could be seen by all the earth, whose leaves were lovely and its fruit abundant, in which was food for all, under which the beasts of the field dwelt and in whom, excuse me, in whose branches the birds of the heavens had their home. Verse 22. It is you, king who have grown and become strong, for your greatness has grown and reaches to the heavens and your dominion to the end of the earth. Daniel says, Your Majesty, the tree represents you and all that you have accomplished as the king of Babylon. And many have been blessed because of you and your leadership. And then it's as if Daniel says, I'm going to get into the details now, King, and you need to know that there's first going to be some bad news, and then I'll finish up with some good news. And so notice, he begins with the bad news in verse 23, and inasmuch as the king saw a watcher, a holy one, coming down from heaven and saying, chop down the tree and destroy it, but leave its stump and roots in the earth, bound with a band of iron and bronze in the tender grass of the field. Let it be wet with the dew of heaven and let him graze with the beasts of the field till seven times pass over him. This is the interpretation, O king, and this is the decree of the Most High which has come upon my Lord the king. Daniel's repeating himself a lot here. But he, he says, the Most High God, the, the one that you constantly talk about that I worship and that lives inside of me. He's given you multiple opportunities to surrender to him. Remember when he gave you that vision of the statue and there were various metals and, and the Lord showed you that you were the head of gold, but that after you would come other kingdoms. King, what did you do? You immediately built an image and it was all gold. 
God says, your kingdom will last a little while, then come others. Nebuchadnezzar, you responded by saying, I'm going to build an image all of gold. God says my kingdom will come to an end. I say my kingdom will go on forever. And Daniel says, that was not good, king. And then you remember when people wouldn't bow down and worship that thing, how you had them cast into a fiery furnace, heated up seven times hotter than normal. You remember that, king? That wasn't good. That was another opportunity for you to yield yourself to the Lord and you continually and in an ongoing way refuse to humble yourself in the presence of the Most High God. You keep putting yourself on the throne of your life when he keeps asking you for that throne. And now, after 35 years of this going on, King, the Most High has sent one of his angels to show you that he's about to chop you down. He's going to pronounce judgment on you. And King, those judgments are, and then notice verse 25, they're going to drive you from men. Your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field, and they shall make you eat grass like oxen. They shall wet you with the dew of heaven, and seven times shall pass over you, till you know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men, and gives it to whomever he chooses. So he says, King, this is the bad news, is that your sins of pride and your sins of arrogance are about to take the ultimate toll, and you are going to lose everything. You're first going to lose your mind. And then you're going to lose your throne. And you're going to lose your kingdom. And you're going to lose your family. And you're going to lose everything that's precious to you because you refuse to humble yourself. In fact, king, it's worse than that. The people that are surrounding you are going to remove you from your throne because you're going to be a crazy man and you're going to live like an animal out in the field like a beast and you're going to eat grass. King, it's going to be the worst thing ever. But king, there's good news. And don't you love God? I mean, I just love God. God always gives us bad news followed by good news if we will respond to him. And, that, and that's the gospel. The word gospel means good news. And when we're told that we're suffering the consequences of our sin, we're also told that Jesus went to the cross and he bore the penalty of our sins so that if we put our faith in his finished work, we don't have to suffer the consequences of our sin. We, we receive forgiveness and the Holy Spirit lives inside of us and he transforms us. And in verse 23, we see the king's good news. And, and there's three things here. We've already read about them. But God commanded some good news in the form of three things that would happen during the seven years of Nebuchadnezzar's judgment. Look back at verse 23, please. I want you to see here that after they chop down the tree, they're going to leave its stump and its roots in the earth. God is telling Nebuchadnezzar, this is going to be a temporary judgment. You've still got a future. This is going to last seven years. And then notice, bound with a band of iron and bronze. Initially, iron and bronze are a picture of judgment, but I want you to see that, that the stump is bound with a band of iron and bronze. P picture a band of metal around the stump. The idea is God is saying to Nebuchadnezzar, I'm going to put you through seven years of discipline but during that time, I'm going to be your protector. We sang a lot of songs about God being our protector this morning. And Nebuchadnezzar is told, you're going to be sustained through this season of judgment. And then a third thing, let it be wet with the dew of heaven. So rather than letting the stump of the tree just dry out and wither away, catch on fire, or something like that, God says to Nebuchadnezzar, Every morning you're going to wake up and, and the dew of the morning is going to be upon you. And it's God's way of saying, we're going to water that stump in preparation of future growth and future fruit bearing. So Daniel says, King, there's some bad news, but there's also some good news. And he gives more good news in verse 26. And inasmuch as they gave the command to leave the stump and roots of the tree, your kingdom shall be assured to you after you come to know that heaven rules. So, so Daniel is speaking to the king and, and he says, King, there's a decision to be made here. Look up at the screen for a minute. 
No Sunday morning would be complete without a quote from Warren Wiersbe. I just have a great commentary on Daniel from Warren Wiersbe, and I, the hardest part is deciding what not to share with you guys, but just one today. Warren Wiersbe comments, and he says, the grand lesson that God wanted the king to learn and that we must learn is that God alone is sovereign and will not permit mortals to usurp his throne or take credit for his works. And God is trying to communicate to Nebuchadnezzar that his pride and his arrogance had just come to a point where God is saying, you're stealing my glory. You're stealing my position. And so that leads us to the next D. We're going to call this the king's decision. Look at verse 27. We're about to see another picture of God's kindness here in verse 27 as Daniel gives the king an opportunity to respond and to repent He says, therefore, O king, let my advice be acceptable to you. Break off your sins by being righteous and your iniquities by showing mercy to the poor. Perhaps there may be a lengthening of your prosperity. So Daniel says something to the king that I think the Lord is saying to people in this room and to people watching online this morning. He he says to the king, King, God has brought you once again, to a crossroads. You are at this crossroads. And if you choose confession of sin and repentance from this pride and this arrogance that you portray, God will remove these things that we've talked about and God will continue to bless you the way he has blessed you. But there's a flip side to this. The flip side is that if he doesn't choose confession of sin and the repentance from arrogance and pride, that he's going to go through the seven years of judgment and discipline that the dream illustrated. And I want to pause for a minute. I want to make this very personal. A lot of people today are probably at a a crossroads and, and you've experienced like Nebuchadnezzar God intervening in your life at key moments. You, you cry out to him and he answers because he's good. But his goal is that when he answered you, when you cried out, that, that you would see your need for him and, and you would completely surrender. You would say to God, here's the throne of my life. I'm stepping off. I want you to sit down there and I want you to rule and reign my life. But what happens is when the crisis is over that we cried out to God about, all of a sudden our need for God to be on that throne is over also. And I think today that God has brought a lot of people here and watching online that are at a crossroads. And and, and there's two groups of people at the crossroads. There's the group that's saying, Pastor Randy, this is amazing. I was just thinking about this and praying about it. Now you're talking about it. And and I really think that I, I need to respond to what you're saying. And, and I even know what you're talking about, PR. I know the specific things where pride and arrogance are ruling in my life and God's not pleased. And I think you're going to do well if you respond to that. But there's that second group that goes, well, PR, I mean, I'm tracking with you up to about this one point. But you know what's weird is I've been in this pride and arrogant rebellion for quite a while and my business has never been better my marriage is strong my kids like me like things are going well and that's exactly what was going on for Nebuchadnezzar is that he was in this bubble of grace God was blessing him even despite that he was in this place so today I want to imitate Daniel And I want to give you some really good advice. Look back at verse 27. Daniel says to the king, let my advice be acceptable to you. And so church, I just want to say this today. I'm going to give you advice from the scriptures. Let my advice be acceptable to you. Confess whatever your pride and arrogance is bringing into your life and make a U-turn on the road of life today. We we call that repentance. Repentance. God has given you a, another opportunity today to make it right, whatever it is. Unfortunately, our friend Nebuchadnezzar, his pride and his arrogance was much stronger than Daniel's exhortation. 
So let's look at the king's discipline. Verse 28 through 33. All this came upon King Nebuchadnezzar. Can we stop? He was at a crossroads. He chose not to listen to Daniel. He chose not to listen to what God was saying to him through Daniel. And all of this came upon King Nebuchadnezzar. This is him writing. He says, this came upon me. I was warned, I didn't take it seriously, and it came upon me. But look again here at verse 29. It says, at the end of the 12 months, he was walking about the royal palace of Babylon. Now, I need your undivided attention for a minute. Just give me your full attention. I want you to notice what's going on here is that a warning has gone forth from Daniel... And another 12 months went by before the warning turned into judgment. And that's where people get in trouble. Because just as Daniel gave a warning and the king a year later says, hey, nothing has happened. I wonder how often a a warning goes forth from the word of God from a pulpit like this. Or from somebody who calls their pastor or a church leader and says, hey, I really need some biblical advice. And so they sit down and across the pastor's office table, biblical advice is given and the person goes, well, yeah, I'll pray about that. Or maybe it's friend to friend sitting in a coffee shop and somebody, you know, comes and says, listen, this is what's going on in my life. And the friend opens his Bible and says, listen, this is what God's telling you to do. And the friend goes, yeah, let me pray about that. And then a year goes by And the person goes, you know, nothing's happened. 11 months and 29 days goes by. But on the one year anniversary, the 12 months, the king is walking about the royal palace. He has not responded and now his heart is not only hard, But his arrogance has hit the high water mark. And I get this picture of God in heaven looking at this angel and saying, go chop that tree down. Go chop down that tree. And and look at this. The king spoke saying, is this not great Babylon that I have built for a royal dwelling by my mighty power? And for the honor of my majesty? And God is probably up in heaven going, I have had enough. King, I've given you 35 years. I gave you a warning. I gave you an extra year to come to your senses. And you stand and look at Babylon with your arms crossed thinking, man, I'm great. Look at what I've done. I've built an amazing kingdom. Look what he says. Is this not Babylon that I have built? Someone shout out, who built Babylon? God built Babylon, right? And then it was a royal dwelling by my mighty power. And for the honor of my majesty, God just says, that's enough. There comes a time where God has to say, enough is enough. And look at verse 31. The judgment comes when the king least expects it. While the word was still in the king's mouth, a voice fell from heaven. King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken. The kingdom has departed from you. And they shall drive you from men. And your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. They shall make you eat grass like oxen. And seven times shall pass over you. Until you know that the Most High God rules in the kingdom of men. And gives it to whomever he chooses. And then verse 33. That very hour the word was fulfilled concerning Nebuchadnezzar and he was driven from men and he ate grass like oxen his body was wet with the dew of heaven till his hair had grown like eagle's feathers and his nails like bird claws and just as God said would happen even though God was patient Nebuchadnezzar's pride and arrogance resulted in him losing his mind losing his throne losing his kingdom he lost his family he lost everything that was dear to him And for seven years, seven long years, he lives like a wild animal. And by the end of the ordeal, 
It's noted here that his hair is long like eagle's feathers and his nails are like bird's claws. Now, as we read this, oftentimes we revert to our childhood and we say it's just another one of those Bible stories where God uses an illustration to show us that if you don't obey him, something really bad might happen to you, right? But if you go and do a little bit of research, you'll find that there's a condition called boanthropy, B-O-A-N-thropy. And it's a rare psychological order in which a person believes that they are a cow or an ox. And those that suffer this condition report not realizing that they're acting like an animal. And it leads researchers to conclude that this condition is linked to the sufferer's dreams. How's that? It started with a dream and it came to pass. Now I know that there's some people in this room and they're thinking that this is utterly ridiculous. Oh, at least first service <laughs> laughed. All right, let's move along. <laughs> I want to just share something. About five years ago, I met a person who used to walk with the Lord. His father was a pastor. And um, a number of years ago, his wife died of cancer. And he began cursing God and questioning God. And, and actually, he got pretty bad um, in cursing God and blaming God. And although I don't believe he has boanthropy, this guy lives like an animal. And we've watched him for a number of years now look more and more like an animal and live more and more like an animal. And, and again, I don't think he's got this. But when we choose to curse God and blame God and not allow God to sit on the throne of our lives, listen, sin will make you crazy. And we have watched the toll that this has taken in this person's life. Now, this chapter ends on a high note, and I'm excited to share with you our final D here, which is the king's deliverance. Verses 34 through 37. And notice the king says, and at the end of the time, and I'm going to pause. I want you to notice that the king comes out and he says, on a number of occasions, God told me this was going to last seven years. God's discipline was going to come into my life and it was going to last seven years. And he says, it wasn't a day less. The king says, don't mess with the Lord. When he warns you that something bad is coming down the pike, you better take him seriously. He says, at the end of the time, seven years, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven and my understanding returned me. And I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him who lives forever. There's a saying in the world of recovery and recovery ministry that you never deny an addict their rock bottom. The idea is when somebody is headed towards rock bottom, oftentimes we who love them step in and provide premature help and they never get to rock bottom and so it just delays the inevitable. Eventually they're going to hit rock bottom. It's better to let them hit rock bottom first. And what we see here is it took really all these years for Nebuchadnezzar to hit his rock bottom and his rock bottom lasted for seven years. But when that rock bottom was over, notice a few things that happened. He was at rock bottom and he lifted his eyes to heaven. God put him in a position where he had nowhere to look but up and when he looked up, he lifted his eyes to heaven and that is a picture in this story here of Nebuchadnezzar dealing with his pride and his arrogance and humbling himself in the sight of the Lord. And notice the first thing he does is he blessed the Most High and praised and honored him who lives forever. He, he worshiped the Lord. His very first act was to worship God. And his understanding returned to him. And notice what he says. For God's dominion is an everlasting dominion. And, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. Nebuchadnezzar says, back in chapter 3, I thought that was me. I thought by building this golden image that, that I was telling God I'm going to last forever and I come to realize now that I've humbled myself. Only God's dominion is everlasting. And then notice, all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. He does according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. No one can restrain his hand or say to him, what have you done? At the same time, my reason 
returned to me. And in these things, Nebuchadnezzar was saying, this is how I used to view myself. When I hit rock bottom, now I see that God is the only one. I am not the God that I thought I was. I've humbled myself, and the first thing that happened, my understanding returned, and then finally, my reason returned to me. So he says, I got crazy from my sin, but repentance restored me. And I want to just show you a, a couple of things, two primary things that God did during this season of discipline in Nebuchadnezzar's life. And the first is that God brought the king into a right relationship with him. And if you're not in a right relationship with the Lord and you're not willing to respond to the Lord, oftentimes he will use a season of hardship and discipline to bring you into a right relationship with him because it will lead you to repentance. And then the second thing, I want you to see that God restored to Nebuchadnezzar what sin had taken away. All sin is rooted in pride. And when he began being so prideful and arrogant that it just created this steamroller of sin, he lost everything. And then as he repented and he came back to the Lord, I want you to notice here in verse 36, he says, and for the glory of my kingdom, my honor and splendor returned to me. My counselors and nobles resorted to me, and I was restored to my kingdom, and excellent majesty was added to me. So the king says, I lost everything. And as I repented, God began giving back what sin had taken away from me. And you'll remember John 10.10, 10, Jesus is speaking. And he talks about the thief. He's talking about Satan and his kingdom. He says, the enemy comes only to steal and to kill and to destroy. And that's exactly what Nebuchadnezzar's pride did. And then Jesus turned around and he said, but I have come that you may have life and life more abundant. And as Nebuchadnezzar repented, God began to bring his abundant life back to him. And so here's Nebuchadnezzar's closing testimony. He says, turn to God during seasons of grace so you don't have to experience God's seasons of discipline. Can anybody say amen to that? I'm going to say it again. Ne Nebuchadnezzar's closing testimony is this. He says, turn to God during his seasons of grace so you don't have to experience his seasons of discipline. And I said it at the beginning of the study and I'll close with this before I close the second closing. <laughs> I believe we're going to see Nebuchadnezzar in heaven. I believe that Nebuchadnezzar came into a covenant relationship with the creator of the universe. And it was a long and ugly process. And it doesn't have to be that way for you and I. So I've got four takeaways from the study today. We're going to put these up on the screen one at a time. But this is what we want to walk away with today. Having studied this chapter, we want to make sure we understand four things because this is going to be fruitful as we minister to ourselves and we minister to one another and we minister to people outside of the church. And the first, the first takeaway from today's study, God pursues us because he loves us. God so loved the world that he sent his only son, Jesus, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. See, apart from a relationship with God through his son Jesus, each one of us will spend eternity separated from the Lord, paying for our own sins. And nobody wants that, and God doesn't want that. And so God began pursuing Nebuchadnezzar, at least on the pages of Scripture, all the way back in chapter 1, and then chapter 2, then chapter 3. It took all the way to the end of chapter 4, 35 years later before Nebuchadnezzar finally responded, but God does not give up. Isn't that wonderful? Do you realize that there is nothing that you've done? You have not sinned to the level that God will not continue pursuing you and forgiving you. There's no way you can out -sin God's grace. And then the second thing I want you to see is that God is patient with us. For 35 years, God gave this king time to repent. 
But listen, this is really important. Had the king repented on day one, think of how much more fruitful his relationship with God would have been than having to live with 35 years of regret as he enters into his relationship with God. So we've got to remember God is patient with us. He kept giving the king time to respond. But listen, we also saw today that there's a time when God's patience runs out and it turns to discipline. So if you're running from God, I encourage you, repent today. Third thing on our list here, our third takeaway, pride is the source of all sin. Therefore, we need to humble ourselves in the sight of the Lord. If we don't humble ourselves, God will find a way to humble us. In James and in Peter's writings, we read over and over and over, humble yourself under God's mighty hand. We read in the New Testament that God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Study that word opposes. It means to contend with, to fight. Who wins when humans fight with God? God. How often? Every time. So don't fight with God. If you, if you continue in pride, God has to oppose you. But when you humble yourself, then God meets you right where you're at. He gives grace to the humble. But in this story, Nebuchadnezzar had to be humbled. So much better to humble yourself than to be humbled. And the final is that God will hear God will forgive and God will restore when we cry out to him in our brokenness. No matter how far you've gone, the Lord will meet you there when you cry out to him with confession of sin, repentance of sin. When you come to the Lord with a broken spirit and a contrite heart, he will in no way ignore you. And so this is the story of Nebuchadnezzar. You get to write your own story. Nebuchadnezzar wrote this chapter to tell us, I am a knucklehead. And even though God loves knuckleheads, he says there was an easier way that this could have gone. And he's saying to us, don't be a knucklehead. Come to the Lord with humility and come to the Lord now. Father, I just want to thank you for Daniel 4. Father, what a powerful, powerful picture of your love and your patience. What a picture of the gospel. Lord, we want to thank you that we don't have to walk the same road that Nebuchadnezzar walked, but many of us will. Many of us, Lord, will continue in this pride and this arrogance and will mistake your lack of judging us for your approval for the things we're involved with and that'll just make it go on longer and longer. And eventually, Lord, you'll, you'll have to put us through the same things that Nebuchadnezzar went through, Lord. A humbling, a breaking, a crushing, a cutting down. And Lord, none of us want to lose everything and end up at rock bottom. Even if it means at some point you restore. How, how much better, Lord, that as soon as you start reaching out to us which you do constantly that we would respond and we would come to you and we would say God you gave your son Jesus he died on a cross after living a perfect life in my place he died a substitutionary death he went into the grave and on the third day he rose again and that's where my faith is. That's where my trust is. That's the source of my forgiveness and my salvation. But Lord, I, I understand that you can be my Savior without being my Lord. And so I also understand that I have to willingly step off of the throne of my life. And I have to willingly invite you to sit on the throne of my life and then allow you to remain there. And we want to pray today, Lord, that whether it be a first-time salvation prayer, someone saying, Jesus, I've been running from you, but now I want you to save me. Or whether it be those of us who are already saved, but struggling with surrender to say to you finally today, Lord, I surrender. 
And I surrender because, Lord, I see your love for me. But I also surrender because I don't want to walk the road that Nebuchadnezzar walked. I want to begin a relationship with you where you are on the throne of my life completely, and I want that right now. For each person who's praying and crying out to you, Lord, the assurance of Scripture is that as we pray to you in Jesus' name, you hear us. And because we know we're praying your will, Lord, we know that these things are taking place in the hearts and the lives of men and women right now. And we thank you for that. And whatever decisions are being made right now, Lord, we pray that by your Holy Spirit, you would empower those and seal them. And that none of us would ever walk the road of Nebuchadnezzar. We just thank you for your goodness, Lord. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh,